All right, let's turn our attention to cricket now. South Africa have a 239-run lead heading into day three of the second and final test against West Indies, being played at Providence in Guyana. The win they started the day on 97 for seven in their first innings and were eventually dismissed for 144, still 16 runs behind the visitors with Jason Holder left unbeaten on 54. Vian Mulder finished as the best South African bowler with 4 for 32. The Proteus then reached 223 for 5 at Stumps, batting a second time with Aidan Markram scoring 51 and wicketkeeper Carl Verena not out on 50. Jaden Seals has so far taken 3 for 52, while Gudakesh Moti has 2 for 61. Fazir Mohammed joins us to review today. Faz, um, welcome back to the Sports Mag Zone. Can we say that the South Africans are firmly in control of this second test? Maybe not firmly, but I would say that they are ahead of the game right now. As I suppose if you judge it purely on the basis of the first innings, you say that South Africa have been won already, leading by 239 with five wickets in hand. But we have to wait and see how things unfold on the third day because it was almost a reversion, a reverting, sorry, to regular test match programming based on 17 wickets yesterday and today a very different pace, a more attritional sort of duel. And really it's going to be important to see if South Africa can push their lead beyond 300 and given the quality of their bowling, it really is going to challenge the West Indies. Yeah, West Indies 97 for 7, bowled out for 144, 16 runs behind South Africa's first innings total. And then the South Africans getting to 223 for 5. An assessment of the West Indies bowling performance today in comparison to yesterday when they bowled the South Africans out. I think what we saw is some of the inconsistencies that continue to bedevil the West Indies because Aidan Markram and Tony DeZorzi clearly intended to, to really take control of the situation. They scored very quickly at five runs per over at the start of their partnership and therefore they were building to an almost impregnable position. But then the West Indies pulled it back. That's when you saw the disciplined effort. That's when you saw the breakthrough eventually coming. Jaden Seals getting the important wicket of De Zorzi for the second time in the match. And then from 120 for 1 to 139 for 5, you really saw the best of the West Indies. With Seals, again, a really good spell, an impressive spell well supported by Gurukesh Moti and they, they, they really built pressure by a, a succession of made overs and, uh, and I know it sounds repetitive but it's one of those things in the game if you could build pressure by limiting the scoring especially in a modern era where players like to score like to see the scoreboard ticking over you increase your chances of getting wickets and then at the end, when certainly the feeling would have been that, look, the West Indies have a very good chance of polishing off the South African lower order before the end of the day, we saw that well-known well determination. We, we've seen it over many, many years, taking on South Africa. Their lower order is often the, the, the engine of a revival. And we've seen this again. The partnership is already worth 84. It, it tested the West Indies. And even towards the end of the day, they were looking for opportunities to score. Wian Mulder took a six of Gurukesh Moti. And then even in the last over, took a, a six of Kabem Hodge. So obviously, they are prioritizing their wickets, yes but looking to score wherever they can. And, and the, the West Indies really tried as, as hard as they could, but they couldn't sustain the effort in that final passage of play at the end of the day. Yeah, two opportunities put down by the West Indians in the field, including uh, Athenes um, putting down Ed Markram when he was on 42. Of course, he went on to make just 51. But looking at how this test match has unfolded, Faz, um, and I know they say that you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. but do you think the West Indian coaching staff, the captain, will be sitting in the dressing room and thinking to themselves, boy, I wish we had played that extra seamer for this test match? I, I, again, you know, you made the important point. It, it's easy to be, to be wise after the fact because <laughs> let, let's look at it this way. Uh, Jamal Warwicka had a very good test match in Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, they were the back Gurukesh Moti, who was 
a, a really a good performer for the West Indies, despite uh, the three 0 drubbing that the West Indies endured last month in England. So you would have again expected him to play. Um, would Kimar Roach have made that difference automatically? We can only speculate. And as I, I recall, uh, who was it? It was one of the Pakistani cricketers talking during the midst of their failed World Cup campaign in India in November, getting a lot of questions about this player and that player. He made a, a very important point. He said, the best player is always the one who didn't get in the team because then you can speculate from now till kingdom come. And I, I thought the West Indies, with the resources that they had, did a very good job, of, of course, on day one. And it's just that South Africa uh, really showed greater determination today. So I don't think it's it's automatic to say that Kim R. Roach, as, as good a bowler as he is with all of his experience, would have necessarily made an automatic difference on day two. Yeah, Faz, I want to get a comment from you on the building pressure that you referenced earlier on, because the commentary panel has experts on it, Faz, people like Ian Bishop, have been there, done that. They understand what is required in, in the top level of, of international cricket. And uh, there were many periods during the afternoon where they kept mentioning that the West Indies were doing a good job of keeping things tight, building pressure. And um, I think there was a, a, a Jason, a Jaden Seals um, wicket that came at the end of a period of sustained pressure by him. And um, they, were, they were praised for it. I say that to say this, because a lot of times coaches get a lot of criticism for what they're doing or what they're not doing. But in moments like those, I am seeing where coach Andre Coley has an imprint on this team, working really hard to, to, to get some things right, even in the face of difficulties. And, and you're absolutely right in that regard, Lance, because, you know, as we often find out, coaches get licks when things go wrong yes. and are ignored when things go right. For example, you hardly heard Andre Coley's name mentioned in that Test match victory in Brisbane. But you heard his name mentioned often and you saw him being focused on often in the 3-0 hammering last month in England. So you can't have it both ways. You've got to give credit where credit is due. And I think what he has tried to do is to try to win players over to that level of understanding that, look, Test match cricket is a different animal entirely. You're not going to get wickets every over. It might happen occasionally, but that is a rarity. You're not going to be able to score as quickly as you would like in the shorter form of the game because this is a different situation. And it takes some time because these players don't play a lot of red ball cricket. They don't play enough of it to feel entirely comfortable with just what you talked about building pressure with a succession of maiden overs. There's always that desire to try something, to try a thing, as we might say. And, and therefore, you, you saw that effort. The challenge, of course, is always to sustain that effort throughout a day, which is, which is difficult because it's hot, it's humid, it's steamy, it's tiring. There's no crowd support to urge you on, which makes a difference as, as well. So all of these factors uh, have to be taken into consideration. I thought the West Indies fought well, but then towards the end, I, I send credit to South Africa. Yeah, and I think part of the plus that we're experiencing here, Faz, is Andre Coley's long-standing partnership or relationship with so many of the players, um, working with them for a long time over the years, and also being a part of the coaching staff of many of these West Indies teams in the past decade. True, but you don't want a situation where there, there's a comfort zone where everyone knows everyone and, and everyone's happy and hunky-dory. I think they need to recognize and, and again, forgive me for, for, for bringing it up once more, that West Indies are at a very low ebb generally when it comes to Test Match Cricket. And that is the major challenge that we face right now. Yes, there'll be the occasional spurt in the white ball formats that will get everybody smiling, like maybe in a week's time when the T20s are played against South Africa. But in Test Match Cricket, there's a lot of work to be done. And having been part of the setup for a long period of time, you wouldn't want Andre Coley to be sort of like taking for granted that, well, he's 
he's there, he's part of the furniture, he's not going to make that much of a difference. Sometimes, even if you've been there for a long time, you have to rock the boat if it becomes necessary. There needed to be a rocking of the boat after England because the West Indies just weren't consistent enough. They had their patches, they had their periods, but it wasn't what was required to win test matches. And yes, it's going to take some time, but because the priority is not the individual, it's not the coach, it's not the star player, it's not the captain, it's not a new player. The priority has to be the welfare of West Indies Test Match cricket. And once Andre Coley and the rest of the support staff, and of course the players, recognize that as the ultimate priority, then there might be a chance of the West Indies slowly working their way forwards. Yeah, and maybe turning the corner. Um, quickly, first, before we go, a, a word on Jason Holder and uh, his role in this West Indies test side and specifically his batting role because he is now situated in that very important number six position and was the top scorer here after a very good innings as well in the second innings of the Trinidad and Tobago test. Well, I think we've seen from the very start of his Test match career when he got a half century in his debut test against New Zealand in Barbados in 2014 and then the very next year, a match-saving 100 in Antigua, we've recognised that Jason Holder has genuine batting ability. Double century against England uh, in Barbados as well and a few other hundreds along the way and not in half centuries. We, we know that ability. But the infuriating thing is that he tends to give his wicket away with those trademark Carl Hooper is soft dismissals at times. And, and that's where you want to see him really tightening up because he can produce a lot for the West Indies in that number six position. position. Of course, he needs support from the lower order, but he must know that his ability certainly warrants him scoring quite a few more runs for the West Indies. It was good to see him getting a half century today with the support from Shamar Joseph. But overall, I think he would recognize more than anyone else that he needs to produce more consistently for the West Indies with the bat. Yeah, very much the case, fans. Uh, Jason Holder, 13 half centuries and uh, three centuries now in his uh, test career. And uh, the West Indies, I'm sure, will be hoping that he'll get century number four in this test match because that would go a long way in helping the West Indies push for a victory. Whether that will be on day three or day four, um, I doubt it will be day five. But whenever it is, hopefully it will come together. Faz, thanks very much as usual. Have a great weekend and I'm sure we'll be chatting early next week. Thank you. Yeah. Lance, who are you picking for this one? West Indies or South Africa? <sighs> South Africa has the upper hand. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to bet against that. That's not what I'm asking, Lance. <laughs> I said South Africa has South the upper Africa. hand. What does that tell you? That they have the upper hand, but yes. they could lose it. West Indies, had, it. West Indies had the upper hand um, just before T yesterday on day one. Yeah. The odds favor South Africa for me. So you're saying you think South Africa will win? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go to break. Interactive on the other side. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning.